where the Apostle Paul's statements are so profound that in a couple of sentences he can uh, destroy a lot of today's uh, doctrines which are found in uh, the so-called churches. Let me read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So I hear a lot of people saying that the gift of tongues is just earthly languages. And yet he's actually made the distinction between the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. And so it is possible for you to speak heavenly languages as well as earthly languages. This is what the apostle is saying. And he says, and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So just as many Pentecostal churches actually teach that unless you have the gift of tongues, and they actually don't distinct between any type of tongues, which I'll go on to explain the apostle says that unless you pray with your understanding, then you're wasting your time. But unless uh, you have charity, he's saying, then the gift is, uh, well, what is the gift? All, all you are is a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And so, do you hear that if a person is born again, that they should go out and do charity? That they should go out and serve mankind? That they should go out and feed and clothe the, the poor? You know, bind up the broken hearted? Um, which is the commission that Jesus Christ gave to the apostles. Um, and Paul is reminding the church that even if you have a gift of tongues, which will distinct between heavenly tongues and there is demonic tongues as well, which will make a distinction about, then Paul is saying, if unless you actually judge the fruit of that tree, unless that person is doing charity, unless that person is helping people, then all they are is a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. He goes on to say in verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, which in Corinthians he said he'd rather speak uh, a sentence or one word in prophecy than a thousand word in, words in tongues, because so that the body can get edified. But he goes on to say, And knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, okay, so that I have all faith that I could remove mountains, so a lot of people, you know, they, they want faith, they want more faith. And yet he says, And have not charity, I am nothing. And so the great emphasis is on Jesus Christ's great commission, that he came to preach the good news to the poor, that he came to bind up the brokenhearted. That's the commission that he also gave to the apostles. You know, So unless the church, your church is involved in these things, then you are nothing before God, even if you have the gift of prophecy and gift of tongues. It doesn't matter. you got to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which God is looking for. The fruit of the Spirit is far more important than the gifts of the Spirit. Although the gifts of the Spirit are important, they are not as important as charity. Now chapter 14 goes on to explain. Um, you can read it all, but this is just an overview. Um, verse 15 from chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. What it... What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. So he's saying that there's a lot of, probably 90% of people who, who pray in tongues in a lot of these Pentecostal churches don't have a clue what they're saying, and there's no interpreter, which he already said, lest you interpret that the church may receive edifying, you know, Verse 5, I would rather you speak with tongues, but rather you prophesied, for greater see that prophecy, and then he that speaks in tongues, except that you interpret, you know. So you must, the church must get edified through what you're doing. <clears throat> Else when thou bless with the Spirit, how shall he occupy the room of the unlearned? Say, Amen, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understands not, what thou sayest. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. And he goes on to say, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might <coughs> teach others also that ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. 
So, what, so basically, um, it's very important that you're praying with your understanding. verse 14 when the women were given the two wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness where she's nourished for time times and half a time from the face of the serpent but what the, the serpent does is that he spews out of his mouth water as of a flood now this can be literal or again it can be false spiritual gifts you can interpret it Usually the Holy Spirit is uh, like water, but if, if the dragon is emulating this, and all that Satan basically does is emulate the gifts of God, he emulates the kingdom of God, um, he is not original in his um, setting up of his kingdom. Um, so what it says, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So this can be, uh, let's say, false spiritual gifts which are not edifying the church. Um, people think it's cool to have spiritual gifts in your, you know, Pentecostal churches, that, that type of environment. If you can speak in a different tongue, then that's awesome. You know, you're, you must be born again. But not really because, you know, Satan and his demons can speak in different tongues as well. And uh, they are not edifying the church. They're in fact bringing curses. And, you know, basically, it says the earth helped the woman. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Praise God. And so, basically, you know, going back to Paul's teachings on 1 Corinthians 13 and 14, it's very important that you speak a few words which edify the body of Christ, which are you know, encouraging someone to uh, repent in a certain area in their life so that God might bless them. You know, that's how you get blessings, because you deepen your understanding of the Word of God. You pray with the understanding that God has given you from the Holy Spirit, which lines up with Scripture, and uh, your life progresses in the Lord. It means that your understanding of the commandments, your application of them, becomes more refined, um, becomes... Um, a way which God is more pleased with. It says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So it's only those with the understanding you know these spiritual gifts which we're given through the Holy Spirit should enable us to further understand the commandments of God as I've just said in application um, and, and the word and deed, basically, as is, is, is Christ came, and it says he grew in the Spirit of God in word and deed, in stature with men and in stature with God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, you know, this is what we should be about. These spiritual gifts are to edify, are to refine, are to give gifts of knowledge, are to give direction to the body of Christ as to how we should be serving one another but especially how we should be uh, showing charity to humanity and bringing um, people who are in prison, um, homeless people, um, orphans, widows, um, being kind, you know, showing the fruit of the Spirit, which is kindness, and, and uh, so that people come into loving Jesus Christ as, as, as we have discovered Jesus Christ and that they can accept Him also as their Lord and Saviour. And so the cycle will go on. They, they will be given gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so the church will grow uh, rather than just being stagnant, rather than just uh, measuring or, or, or judging each other 
according to the so-called gifts of the Spirit we have. And Paul's already said, you know, if you don't have charity, you're absolutely nothing, you're nobody, as with regards to the Kingdom of God. So we have in Galatians chapter 5, uh, the things which we shouldn't get involved with, which are not of the Holy Spirit, but we see in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Um, and it says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. There is actually affections in the flesh, which are fleshly affections, but he's drawing the very, very serious distinction between the flesh and the spirit. So if you say you're spiritual, why aren't you more about God's kingdom then? You know, you can love your spouse or your brother or your sister easily, fine, you love them. Go and uh, feast with them um, in the, 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 you know, the pagan holy days which the Bible speaks against. So again, this could be speaking about touch, taste, feel, which, which is to do with the pagan festivals. But the, the biblical festivals are all to do with the, the Rohach, the Holy Spirit, um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, his character, his personality, what he would do for his church, you know, on the Feast of Passover, on the Feast of Pentecost, on the Feast of Tabernacles, you know, on the Feast of Hanukkah, spiritual things. And yet, um, verse... Uh, 19, or let's read from uh, 16. This is the, uh, then walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so that you can't do the things that you should or you would do, you're called to do. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Okay? If you be led of the spirit, then you're, you're going to be basically keeping God's commandments. You're not going to be under the curse of the law. You're not going to be trying to keep the commandments out of a fleshly carnal understanding of them. But through walking in the Holy Spirit, you are going to be honoring the Ten Commandments. Okay. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, which is breaking one of the commandments, fornication, breaking one of the commandments, uncleanliness, which is breaking perhaps a food law, or it could be uh, usually un uncleanliness is, is with regards to breaking food laws in the Bible. I'm sorry, but you can study that. Lasciviousness, idolatry, which is the second commandment, witchcraft, which is one of the deadly sins, hatred, which is a fruit of not of the Holy Spirit. If you're hating evil, then that's love hates evil. You know, if you have true love, you actually hate evil. But just hatred is, is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you're hating people, if you're hating God, if you're finding fault with God, finding fault with other people, and it's alright to let the Bible instruct you in the ways of righteousness, which therefore we have to admit that we are wrong, but... Um, you know, you have to allow the Bible to correct us in the Word of God. And sometimes He does send people in order that uh, we can be more corrected, more refined in our walk. At varying, so always arguing, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. Um, all of these are going on in the churches today. Envyings, um, which is the Tenth Commandment, Thou shalt not covet. Murders, which is obviously Thou shalt not kill. Or thou shalt not murder, drunkenness, which obviously weakens your uh, stance in the Lord. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're drunk, it means you're more susceptible to sin. Revelings and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, because they're not walking in the Spirit. Even though they are saying they're walking in the Spirit, you know, we can see the fruit in their lives, that they're contentious, and that they're rebellious, and that they're not actually um, bringing themselves into subjection unto the Word of God, which His servants speak to them.